But Irwin Allen's meticulous preparation couldn't put out fires among a few unhappy stars. William Holden was reportedly bitter over his third billing behind McQueen and Newman, and over what he considered a one-dimensional role. Holden and others were also frustrated by the occasional tardiness of Faye Dunaway. Oh, I love Faye. One of the fun ladies to work with. But Faye had a few moments where I guess she didn't quite make it to the set, and so we had all the people there, and Jennifer Jones was right there. And where's Faye? No Faye. And after a while, Jennifer said, well, uh, I guess it's time for me to go home too then. And, and she waited long enough time, and so she left. William Holden's frustration finally exploded two months into filming when he reportedly shoved the actress against the wall and physically threatened her if she was ever late again. For the next month, Dunaway had a perfect attendance record. What can we do about it? What do you suggest? Well, work together. Tabloid reporters were also predicting an explosion any day between Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. But the expected eruption never happened, as these behind-the-scenes bloopers suggest. You've got 15 minutes left, and that's all. <laughs> Self-destruct. The most fun was Paul Newman. He was definitely, he definitely liked to have a good time. You're looking very pleased with yourself, I must say. You bet your sweet ass. Cut. Very nice. <laughs> he, has, he has a very naughty sense of humor. He loves practical jokes. And I think he knew that this movie was what it was. It wasn't going to be his, his Oscar-winning best performance ever, you know. So he was having a good time there. And yet, of course, he was always completely professional. In their few scenes together, Newman and McQueen worked in an atmosphere of respect and friendly competition. That's it. Let's get the f*** out of here. Leave this guy with the camera here. Okay, cut. <laughs> See it, please. Newman and McQueen were ready for that stuff. You know, they're macho guys. They loved it. Can we do this? How about more water? To the studio's horror, McQueen and Newman both insisted on doing as many of their own stunts as possible, and both suffered minor injuries. On May 31st, Newman developed a facial allergy triggered by smoke. A week later, the actor burned his hand. Marker. Not to be outdone, Steve McQueen defied the studio and its insurance company by doing a hazardous jump into an elevator shaft. McQueen twisted his ankle badly, and the actor was incapacitated for several days. With costs already climbing from 11 to 14 million dollars, the script was quickly rewritten to let McQueen do several scenes in a sitting position. To film the harrowing elevator rescue, a multi-story section of the building's exterior was created at the 20th Century Fox Ranch in Malibu. Matte paintings were later added to give the illusion that characters were stranded 58 floors above ground. But for the actors, including Irwin Allen's real-life fiancée, Sheila, the danger seemed real enough. We were stuck on the side of a building, and Irwin kept blowing up uh, bombs or something right, right next to us. And here we all were in chiffon, and these sparks would come flying in through the window. It was a bigger explosion than anybody thought. There was panic, and everybody else was running. There were trees on fire that weren't supposed to be burning. So while you're busy acting, terrified and everything, you're going, you're hitting your, your dress to keep, the, <laughs> keep, keep from going on fire. McQueen dropped me once, and I missed the airbag and everything on the stage. He came off that elevator and said, you better pay this guy a lot of money. He was uh, a good guy. He always wanted the best for the project. He, on the elevator scene, I was doing that with his double. And he came the next day and asked me how it went. And I said, eh, I think it could have been better. And he called all the execs together. And they all came in with their limos and all about 20 some of them in a big circle. And then he said, I want to fix that scene. And they said, why? It was great. We loved it. Why do you want to redo it? He said, because Ernie said, these execs looking around, who are you? Who? That stunt guy actor because Ernie said and they made it what it is. The movie's many stuntmen and women were in almost constant jeopardy 
especially the 25 who met a fiery end on camera. Each person wore a non-flammable bodysuit, coated with a mix of benzene and alcohol, which was ignited for a chillingly realistic effect. Action! Got 15 seconds. 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Put him out, go in and get him, go get him. We did have some near accidents on that. Like the guy that came out of the elevator on fire, they cover him with glue and they have all kinds of fire protective Nomax. Well, he had somehow brushed his face with this flaming glue and the glue he couldn't get off his face and that burned his lip. When Backstory returns, a final flood of creativity completes the decade's hottest blockbuster. I want to try to put out the fire by blowing up the water tanks above us. It can mean a lot of water and steel and concrete, but if they don't try it, we're all going to burn. The fire's out of control below us. This way, some of us might survive. We got no option. Get them all in position, let them start tying themselves down. No sequence in the towering inferno would be more complicated or difficult to film than the climax, in which the skyscraper's main water storage tanks are detonated in a desperate attempt to put out the blaze. Camera number five, Marker. We now have speed on all cameras. I will count one, two, three, and after that, the big explosion will occur. Six giant water tanks were placed above the massive promenade set. It was built 11 feet off the ground to allow a vast water runoff and prevent the actors from drowning when thousands of gallons were unleashed. Action! After four exhausting months of production, the towering inferno finally wrapped shooting on September 11th, 1974. There were 69 sets when we started, but applauding the picture, there were only two when we finished. We burned down everything. Just three months later, on December 16th, the movie opened amid a blaze of publicity set off by its producer. Despite mixed reviews, the towering inferno lived up to the expectations of audiences around the world. The film that cost two studios $14 million grossed a remarkable $200 million in a first run that lasted nearly a year. But the film did receive harsh criticism from builders, who claimed that the movie gave an incorrect and inflammatory picture of safety in modern skyscrapers. Ironically, just two months later, a massive fire broke out in the world's tallest building, the World Trade Center. This picture opened up a lot of eyes codes within cities had to be changed so that all buildings had sprinkler systems and so forth and fire escape systems. In 1975, the towering inferno defied its detractors by earning eight Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. It went on to win three Oscars for Best Cinematography, Best Editing, and Best Song. You know, one of these days, you're gonna kill 10,000 in one of these fire traps. And I'm going to keep eating smoke and bringing out body until somebody asks us how to build them. OK, I'm asking. Over a quarter century after its making, the towering inferno continues to dazzle moviegoers with its irresistible blend of cliffhanging adventure and stunning special effects. 
Its story of remarkable people overcoming incredible odds was also lived behind the camera on a production skillfully run by a fearless Hollywood showman. Irwin Allen took a big gamble on that picture and uh, it proved to be pretty one of the best pictures of that kind. But he did it and he loved it. It was one of the most thrilling experiences you could have on a, watching this thing being made. Towering Inferno will live for a long, long time. Thank you, thank you, and good night.